Good evening. My name is John Milburn, and this is the first week for Contract B. Thank you all for attending. I appreciate your participation. This term, we'll be dealing with issues around contract at a more advanced level to that which you've already encountered in Contract A. I guess Contract A was all about that which you need to establish a contract, um, whereas now we're in arguably the more interesting area of discussing what happens when things go badly or when parties wish to attack the validity of a contract on the basis of some vitiating factor. Misrepresentation, mistake, things of that nature. We'll also deal with some of the remedies and remedies is an area of particular interest to me because it's essentially answering the question, well, what can we do about that when you encounter a particular situation? So my name is John Milburn. I'm the unit coordinator. I have taken this unit in the past and I look forward to engaging with you and working with you in this term. Now, can I just um, identify, have I worked with any of you previously on other units because I'm not seeing a lot of familiar names or faces. And please use the chat facility if you wish. All right. Intro. Yes, I, I took intro a little while ago. So not too many by the look of it, but um, I look forward to working with you in this unit um, this year. So one thing that you'll find with the way in which I like to communicate with you is to encourage you to work backwards. Now that may seem counterintuitive, but what I mean by that is it's very important that you understand the end goal that you wish to achieve, identify what it is that you want from the unit at the end, and then work back to see if you can achieve that. I guess for many of you, the ultimate aim is to pass the unit. But I hope that it's more than that. I hope that it's a learning experience in a very practical way as well. Um, by way of background, I've been a lawyer since 1984. I did articles of clerkship in a large firm, um, which was after studying at um, University of Queensland, then going into a large firm. You worked there for a couple of years to complete your practical work. I was a solicitor until 2016, a barrister, until earlier this year and now a magistrate and tribunal member. And I have the privilege of being um, a university lecturer and I've, I've been doing that for about eight or nine years in a range of subjects, a range of units. Um, now the focus of this unit is possibly aimed at those who wish to practice in law, but I know that many of you won't practice in law and many of you perhaps don't have aspirations to do so. And that's okay. But the reason that I'm pitching this, for want of a better term, at those who wish to practice, is that it seems to me that given we're studying law, we want to know how it works in a practical sense. Now, it may be that if you're not practicing in law, you may be engaging with people who do, or it may be that in your profession, in your job, you need to identify legal issues at a preliminary level. So this unit will help you in that regard. Or it may be just in terms of your personal circumstances, some of the things that we discussed this year may be of relevance to you. So please excuse me for pitching it as it were to a practitioner level, but that's what I, I, I want to do. And it follows then that I'll be asking you to think like a lawyer in the context of your study. So some of the assessment work that I ask you to do this term is pretending that you are a lawyer. So please embrace that and enjoy it. Now, one of the things about lawyers is that it's almost part of the job description to have some acting skills. Obviously, advanced skills in communication is important. And I'll stress that in the assessment work in two ways. The first is that I expect a high level of written communication, and we'll talk about that. 
and you'll have the joy of, in the second assessment, providing some advocacy communications and um, advancing some of your skills there. Now, I don't want you to be scared of the assessment, but rather I'd hope that you look at what it is that you need to achieve in terms of the assessments. And um, I'll break now to ask, has everyone had a look at the first two assessments in terms of the actual content and the work that needs to be done? Don't worry, I won't name names. I'm getting a lot of yeses coming through. Excellent. If you haven't, please do so straight after this session. If you're watching this as a recorded session, please stop the video now and have a look at the assessment work. Because, as I said, I want you to know what's ahead of you and then work back towards where we are right now. Lawyers have um, a particular mindset, and I'll, I'll just talk about some of these introductory things because this is still a first year level unit. Um, lawyers think in a certain way and talk in a certain way. And at this stage, I want you to feel as though you're part of the profession, you're part of the club, so to speak. Um, and we'll give you some tips on that, how it works in practice. But first, thinking like a lawyer. Now, this is a, a quote from the new lawyer. Um, I don't know if any of you have used that text as part of your introduction to law studies. It was the text that I used when I was take, teaching introduction to law. But at page 286 of the new lawyer, Foundations of Law, there's this quote, and it says, Thinking like a lawyer means keeping a cool and clear head and speaking and behaving rationally when others around you may be panicking or overreacting. Why is that relevant to contract? There's a lot of work to be undertaken in contract law. There's a lot of reading. There are a lot of concepts, a lot of things that you need to wrap your head around. And it's easy to panic. Um, or to be overwhelmed. So just remember, thinking like a lawyer, you need to keep cool, clear head, speak and behave rationally, and keep it together. I know that's difficult. So when I talk about trying to think about your objectives, ultimately, what I'm looking to do is to essentially make things easier for you. You might say, why, why is that going to make it easier? I'll give you an example. So outcome thinking, which is what I'm advancing now, essentially relies upon you thinking about what it is that you wish to achieve, and then in reverse order, thinking about how to achieve that result. Think about the cost to you physically, emotionally, and financially if you fail, and it's not meant to be scary, but meant to encourage you. Um, and with the benefit of hindsight, you may think about what you would consider doing differently if you had your time again in week one. So what I'm going to do now is ask you to think about the potential issues that might arise while you're studying this and think about solutions that work for you. I know that's all very vague. I'll give you an example. So let's assume you're a lawyer and your employer sends you a text you know, at 8 p.m., that's the sort of thing that happens. And your employer says, um, please attend at court at 8.30 a.m. because I need you there. Now, let's assume you forget and you go straight to the office and you arrive at the office at 8.30 a.m. How do you feel when the partner of the law firm comes to you and says, you let me down, I needed you there, I had a particular task for you? What would you have done or what should you have done to avoid this easily avoidable mistake? I'm going to ask now for you just to get practicing on using the technology and just type in the chat facility, what would you do in that situation if your employer says, please go to court, not the office at 8.30 a.m. tomorrow? Any thoughts? And you can unmute the microphone as well. So put a reminder in your calendar straight away, yes. 
reply to the text and advised whether you can make it or not. I like that thinking. What else would you do to make sure that this happens? A whole range of things. Email reminder, phone reminder. You can ask Google or Siri to help you and remind you, can't you? Um, another practical way, um, one that I used to do in the old days, pre Google, Siri and uh, electronic uh, reminders, was I used to put the keys in the fridge. Um, and of course, they weren't electronic keys in those days as well. So when I went to get the, you know, to drive, I, where are my keys? Oh, they're in the fridge. Why are they in the fridge? Oh, that's right. Because I have to go to court. You know, just that type of thing. Other um, options, put it in the phone, put a post-it on your keys, clothes out, alarm on, all set before bed, staple a reminder around the steering wheel, yes, have your bag packed ready for court, all of those sorts of things. Now, I know it's a silly example because you'd never forget that. It's easy to, to do that. But the point that I'm trying to make is this. Create for yourself a mechanism that works for you where you can ensure that those things that are easily avoided, those mistakes that are easily avoided are um, avoided by you. And you're not in that horrible feeling of thinking things have gone really badly for me. I should have avoided that issue and it was so easy for me to do so. Now, <clears throat> Bearing in mind what I've said about preparation in reverse, what I'm going to ask you to consider doing is this. that take You know that um, there are three assessment pieces. I take it you know when those assessment pieces are due, and they are Thursday the 13th of August for the first one. Thursday the 17th of September, for the second one, and the third one. Can anyone tell me when the third one is due? You can unmute your microphone if you want. 17th of October. Very good, Saturday. And you'll know about that when? When will you find out the content of that last one? Can anyone tell me? 16 October, the day before, exactly. So. You won't know what's in that paper. But sometimes I'm a little generous and sometimes I give little hints. So what I'm going to suggest is that if you hear anything at all relating to the take-home paper, you catalog that information in a way that works for you. It might be a separate document. It might be a series of post-it notes or something in your calendar, whatever it is. But if you hear take-home paper, you know, you should, you should take particular note. Like my old rugby coach used to say when I was a kid, you know, if the if you're in the opposition's 25 as it was then, or vice versa, then you need to increase your intensity. So if you hear the words "take home paper," increase your intensity because it might be helpful, it might be relevant. The other thing that I'm going to ask you to do is this: sometime in the next day or two, certainly this week. Go to week 12 in the material. Again, philosophy of working in reverse. Go to week 12 in Moodle. Has anyone actually done that? Gone to week 12 and had a look? Uh, yes, had a look so at all um, on the way through. Yes, Timo? Oh, yes, I've actually done that. When I was looking through the course, I actually found it very helpful. Looking at the end lecture, and you were talking about exams. Yes. And so that means I'm like, okay, I better put um, my organisation into gear and start from week one. So that was very helpful. That was great. Excellent. Thank you very much for that plug. And that's exactly what I want you to do. Go to week 12. You'll see there's a video that I prepared a couple of years ago. Um, it was specifically talking about how to prepare for exams and short window take-home papers. Take-home papers have a few different names, but essentially take-home papers. And of course, this is a unit that used to have an invigilated examination. So post COVID, you know, we don't have the sit down exams. Um, so you have a take home paper instead, but the same principles apply. I won't talk too much about what that, that's in that video. Thank you, Timo, for looking at it. But I want you to embrace that, consider it, 
and work towards it. That, the, the content of that video is intended to be aspirational, but achievable at the same time. I hope that makes sense. So what we now know is when the assessment work is due, we know to take note of anything to do with take-home papers. We are very mindful of working backwards and ensuring that we do what we can to achieve what uh, results we want and avoid the obvious hiccups that may, uh, in, it may, you may encounter. Now, can I ask you this? Does everyone know how to submit assessment work through Moodle? For example, the first assessment due on the 13th of August. Just yes or no. Does everyone know how to submit work? Yes. Great. If you don't, everyone's saying yes. If you don't, maybe you're watching this as a recorded session, so someone doesn't, um, I'm going to ask if you'd be kind enough just to try it out, just, just have a look at it, get a feel for it, um, and maybe ask for some help. And the starting point for help, it seems to me, is to ask me and your colleagues in this unit. If you're comfortable enough to do that. Here's another thing, another thing about lawyers. I've mentioned that there's a degree of acting skills. Uh, Bridget has offered to help out. So thank you very much, Bridget, for that. There's a degree of acting skills in law, but there's also another important thing, and that is a collegiate attitude. You may think from watching TV that lawyers just attack each other and bash each other all day long. There are some that do that, but by far the great majority are collegiate in nature. And we help each other. Um, so get used to asking questions and asking for help. Try to form some study groups. Um, ask questions through Q and A. You know, if you send me an email, asking for some information, advice, or some, something else, odds are I'll answer you as quickly as I can, but I may put a little note at the end saying that's a great question. Others may wish to, may be asking, thinking about the same question, may want to engage in the discussion. So please ask through Q&A, and I'll ask people to redo that. Um, so we all have a chance to learn from each other and support each other. You need to do that because the stress levels associated with, I guess, depression and anxiety amongst university students, according to one study that's referred to in The New Lawyer, is by far the highest when it comes to dealing with law students. I think medical students are second. One of the reasons for that is because of the volume of material that we have to consider, the speed at which we need to take that in and the feeling of isolation. So try to work on that and work as a team. So don't think about competing with your colleagues in this unit, but think about your colleagues in the unit in, in that collegiate supportive manner of you're all trying to um, get through and do the work together as best you can. So um, the first assessment is pretty straightforward. It's, I think, 2,000 words. Submissions need to be subject to a citation reference style, the Australian Guide to Legal Citations, version four. Does everyone know the AGLC? Has everyone worked through that? You've had experience with it? You know, it's, um, it looks pretty obvious when someone doesn't because they may not use footnotes, for example. So the basic rule is footnote reference. If you source information or an idea from an external source, the golden rule is cite your material, reference the material. That'll avoid plagiarism and it'll also show that you're reading widely. So two good reasons to reference your material. Using footnote referencing, say in the Word program, which I'm sure the great majority of you would use for creating your work, is very simple. Again, 
Does everyone know how to footnote reference? Do you know how to put in the little superscript and it will come up with the footnote ready for you to populate with information? Does everyone know how to do that? If you don't, please let us know now because as Bridget has offered to help out Nat, others will be willing to help you, I'm sure. But from the look of the responses, everyone knows how to footnote reference. And AGLC is better than APA. I agree with that, Bridget. So <laughs> if you um, don't know how to use the basic footnoting, if you don't know the basics about AGLC4, we need to learn that quickly. We need to get on top of that this week. Okay, so I need you to footnote reference and follow some of the basic rules, you know, the superscript referencing, only one superscript per concept. Um, look, a good way of doing this is if you look in your textbook or the case book, um, you'll see material which is um, footnote referenced and just adopt that approach follow that type of approach and you can't go too far wrong. I hope that makes sense. So the first assessment is pretty straightforward and we're really dealing with some of the material in relation to um, videation of, of contracts, videating circumstances. Now the second assessment might be on its face a little more challenging. Is everyone going to be comfortable with a video presentation? Do we think we know how to do that? My suggestion is you probably need to upload it through YouTube and then I'll look at it. You can take it down afterwards if you like. And if you're really sensitive about it, you can ask me for, you know, you can upload it and ask for a special priority to have it considered and then um, uh, removed. But it could be an excellent marketing tool for you as well. It'll help you to stand out from the crowd potentially and enjoy the process. Um, <laughs> Pauline says, I'll be wearing a mask. Yes. <laughs> um, it's a really good process to express yourself in that way. Now, there are two ways we could have done this. I could have had group A versus group B. I could have had different camps, but I, my view is let's look at this collectively. I don't mind if you talk to each other in a collegiate fashion about the second assessment or the first assessment or indeed any of the content. Leads me to another point. Sometimes law students are a bit worried about collusion, which is bad, versus collaboration, which is good. So, do you think you know the difference between collusion and collaboration? Any, we'll have some yes or no or comments if you want to unmute the microphone. Collaboration is working together, says Sophie. Yep, good. Yep, so essentially collaboration is this collegiate attitude, this feeling of working together perhaps potentially sharing some ideas, but you, you need to know where the line is in terms of academic integrity, which is really um, uh, dealing with issues to do with cheating. Um, so academic integrity is critically important at this stage. So what that means is number one, plagiarism. How do we avoid plagiarism allegations? Can anyone tell me? What's a good way of avoiding any allegation of plagiarism? It's very practical. I've talked Reference about it tonight. Reference and cite everything. That's it, Jenna. Just cite everything. Because I'm not here to ask you to invent the law or to reinvent the law. I'm certainly here to ask you to know the law know where to find the law and then how to apply it. But knowing the law requires you to look at legislation, case law and secondary materials. And if you do, and you say, you know, um, you, you cite a proposition, 
A equals B is a proposition, let's say. And you say, and, and the reason I say that is because that's what section 37 of the A equals B Act says. So you cite that and you say, well, sec refer to section 37 or refer to a case or refer to a textbook. So plagiarism can be avoided by ensuring that you cite your material. There's also a thing called self-plagiarism. You've got to be a little careful with this. Um, and it means citing your own material um, or referring to your own material. Um, I'm less concerned about than that than others may be. Collusion is where you're unfairly cheating in circumstances where you are um, using other people's direct work, for example, uh, and going beyond lawful collaboration. Um, cheating, of course, contract cheating, academic misconduct, all of those things we know we can't do. So I'm going to ask you to do a little research through the material that's available on the um, student integrity section of the um, Moodle site um, in terms of collaboration versus collusion. So you, know, you can know what to do. And you may find yourself uh, needing some help. Ask for some help through this unit or the student success team um, can help you as well. SAT at cqu.edu.au. Um, now, I mentioned earlier that law can be a stressful process of learning. And again, citing the new lawyer, um, page 369, it, there's a chapter dealing with self-management skills. And the authors say, learning self-management skills at law school is important if you are to ensure that you maintain good psychological health during and after your legal studies. For example, a study led by Catherine Lay assessed 955 students at the University of Adelaide and found that 58% of law students were psychologically distressed. This was the highest level of distress recorded across the disciplines. Medical students were second at 44. So the study shows that there are special issues for law students and emphasizes the need for students to take particular care of their psychological health. Again, not meant as a to make you scared, but just to be um, conscious of the fact that you need to ask for help and be well organised. Um, one of the problems with law is that it's constantly changing. And one of the things that you can do about that is you can supplement your reading by accessing some of the excellent and free online resources that are available to you through services such as Jade Barnett. And does anyone know Jade? It's one of my particular favorite learning platforms in law. Anyone had a look at Jade? Well, there's another thing for you to do this week. Have a look at Jade. Yes, says Renee. Um, you can subscribe to get updates about the latest cases in particular areas of practice from yesterday or the day before, for example. So, if in contract law, there's a high court decision that's relevant to what you study, it's not going to be in the textbook, is it? And I may not refer to it, but because you subscribe, you may get this in your inbox. And imagine how good that would be to refer to a case decided last week when you're writing your take home paper on the 16th and 17th of October. So that's not meant to be something where you think, oh, this is much more work than I've already got. It's actually meant to keep you at the cutting edge and allow you to keep on top of things. So that's Jade, J-A-D-E or Jade Barnett, B-A-R-N-E-T-T. -T. A great service. And the university has on its online resources some excellent products. Um, which are some of which is free and some which are paid and they're quite expensive. So you've got plenty of resources to look at. If you want some general commentary over and above the text or maybe to supplement the text, there are some very good 
So, and Pauline's put in the reference here, HTTPS colon forward slash forward slash J dot I O forward slash thank you. There are some excellent um, resources available. I particularly like Paulsbury's as a general commentary starting point. Um, so keep that in mind. And, you know, I guess some of this is really intro type stuff, but have you all had a chance to look at the online resources for the university? Have you looked at the different platforms that are available to you? Lexis, Nexus, Butterworths, um, Ostley. Great. Now we're getting some notes saying yes. So what I'm going to ask you to do now is, as Renee has already done, reading my mind, which are your favourite platforms? So Renee says Lexus, which is LexisNexus, and Ostley. Westlaw, very popular, says Bridget. Timo says Jade. Craig, Westlaw. Jay, Lexus, Alice, Westlaw fan. And you do, you do tend to get that. Some people use both platforms equally. Others tend to go into one camp or the other, depending on their preference. That is particularly LexisNexus or Westlaw. Um, Caxton Street for general reference material is great as well. So these online services are really useful. Um, when it comes to legislation, there are a few different sources. It's not authorised, but Ostley is really very good, and I use it extensively in practice. All right. Um, so you need to develop your own resources. Does anyone know about noting up and case citators? Does anyone know if, I, if you said to, what, to note up something? Anyone ever heard of that? Renee says yes. Very helpful. Yeah. So just as an exercise, another one for this week, go into legislation, Queensland, let's say Ostley, have a look at a section, and then on the right-hand side, look at Note Up, click the link. Now, it's not every section is covered, so you may have a few hit and miss situations here, but if you click on Note Up, it may show you a list of cases relevant to that section. And that can be useful because it provides you with some way of better understanding the section. Um, otherwise, there are generally two main sources of our law. I know this is a bit intro in its nature, but it's important we get these fundamentals understood. Can anyone tell me what I mean by primary sources of law? If I talk about the primary sources of our law... Legislation. Yes, Jenna, yes. And? Case law. Case law. Also known as, Renee's got it, common law. So if I talk about the common law, I'm really talking about case law. Uh, legislation, acts of parliament, statutes, these are all synonyms for that same concept. And of course, we talk federal, which is commonwealth, or state, which is primarily, given that we're in Queensland, uh, Central Queensland University state legislation. But when it comes to answering problems, you know, to some degree, I'd really like this to be as relevant to you as possible. So um, quite often I'll allow people to answer questions relevant to their state rather than Queensland, if, if that's appropriate. But I've got to be careful with that. Um, and if I make it clear that it's a Queensland-based question, then you'll need to make it Queensland-based response. So primary sources of law, legislation and case law. What are secondary sources of law? What are some examples and what does that mean? Secondary source of law. Renee says textbooks, yes. Journal articles, orders, journals, yep rules, regulations, they're more primary. Bench books, oh, that's an interesting one, Renee. 
If you don't know about bench books, have a look. They're terrific. Ministerial, ministerial speeches. Now, second readings. Some of you have done statutory interpretation. I don't know if you did that with me or not, but um, second reading speeches, explanatory notes, explanatory memorandums are very useful and not, not necessarily a whole lot of extra work because, for example, an explanatory note or explanatory memorandum, depending on whether it's state or federal, is actually a very useful resource because it goes to provide some commentary about why the legislation was introduced, what is the intention of the legislation, and that helps you to understand it. So if you're tr struggling with the wording of some legislation, then maybe the second reading speeches, for example, um, are, are a good way, a good resource. Now, does everyone know, it's all very well to say, all the explanatory note or the explanatory memorandum, if you had to find the explanatory note, for example, for some Queensland legislation, let's say the Property Law Act, would you know how to find it? Yes, no? Yes, good. Yes, excellent. Now, if you've worked with me in some of the earlier units, intro and statutory interpret, you'll know that I'm very keen on you having some sort of book that works for you um, and shortcut. So as you're developing these skills and this information about how to access material, then catalogue it in some way that works for you um, would be very useful. So when it comes to finding the law, many people make the mistake of thinking that it's only in the textbooks. In fact, legislation is the largest source of our law um, by far. It's the most fundamental, it's the most basic, it's the most important, because legislation will overrule case law, sort of, um, because case law can sometime, sometimes interpret the legislation which creates this common law um, that we talked about earlier. But legislation is very important. Case law is very important. So it means that you know, need to know how to find legislation. You need to know how to find case law. I generally encourage people to look at the primary sources of the law first and then the textbooks for clarification. But you may go the other way. You may want to read the study guides and the textbooks to get a general idea of where it's going and then look at the legislation and the case law and that's fine as well. All right, um, so what's contract B all about? Finally, we talk about contract. So in contract A, we talked about issues to do with the formation of a contract, didn't we? Offer acceptance, contractual terms, things of that nature. This term, we look at essentially what can go wrong and what can you do about it. We deal with Vitiating factors such as mistake, misrepresentation, duress, undue influence, unconscionable contracts, illegal and void contracts. And we also talk about how contracts can be discharged, assigned, varied, terminated, um, and related issues such as estoppel. So I guess you could break the unit down into three main parts. Part one which is weeks one to five, deal with vitiating factors in a contract. What might go wrong? Mistake, duress, misrepresentation, undue influence, illegality, things like that. So if there are issues that go to strike at the fundamental nature of the contract as a result of one of these vitiating factors, it can have significant legal consequences, which creates legal difficulties, of course. So we, um, sorry, part two, which is weeks six to 10 inclusive, talks more about remedies. What can we do about the issues that have arisen? So we examine the termination of contracts, the remedies that a court can apply to do, ju to do justice to assist an innocent party. And the final part, week 11, which essentially will be essentially non-examinable, 
is international and transnational contracts. Um, it's a lot more common than you think, uh, probably because of the advent of the internet and the prevalence of the internet. We're actually engaging in international contracts, you know, when we, we buy things over the internet, etc., or interstate contracts, you know, international, uh, transnational contracts and things of that nature. So, but mostly I'm uh, keen for you to learn the first two parts to the unit, videating factors and remedies. So have a look at the material in the study guide to give you an idea of what it is that you should achieve as a result of reading um, the study guides and engaging in this unit. All right, so week one, it's all about mistake. Has everyone had a look at the flow chart? You've got the flow chart for mistake. Did you find it useful? I think it's excellent. I didn't draft it. So I'm, I'm riding on the shoulders of some giants here that have preceded me. Um, AJ and um, uh, Anthony. So I've had some input, but um, a lot of the material has been provided and it's a very high quality material. I haven't released all of the material that's available to me. I don't want to overwhelm you, but do keep an eye out for week to week because I will release some fresh material from time to time. I think the flowcharts are a really good way of trying to conceptualize the issues and answer a legal problem. Now, I'm less, I won't say fan, I'm, I'm less concerned, uh, and I don't mean that flippantly, about the Iraq method than other unit coordinators might be. Does anyone know what I mean by the IRAC methodology? Yes? All right, so what does it stand for? What does that acronym stand for? IRAC. We'll see who's the fastest typist. Yes, Alice won it. Well done, Alice. Just got ahead of Renee, Alana, Bridget, Sophia. You all have got it right. Issue, rule, application, conclusion. In introduction years ago, um, just to, as a brief aside, I used to challenge students. I used to say, who do you think is the fastest typist in the, in the class? And in week 12, I'll challenge you to a typing test. And I'm a hopeless typist, but I consistently used to win. I don't do this anymore. But can anyone think of how I could possibly have won a typing test when I don't know how to type really very well? Macros, good idea. Copy and paste, yes. Talking to text, yes. See, years ago it was a bit of a, uh, it was unusual, but it's quite co um, common now. So I use a program, Dragon, give, them, give Dragon a plug, and uh, I find it very useful. One of the things that I, the reason I'm saying that now is that um, you may find that if you're struggling with the typing component of the unit, then maybe think about voice recognition. It's really very sophisticated and very reliable now. It wasn't so much 20 years ago, but it's, it's very good now. And um, it serves a supplementary purpose. And I did, actually did a video on this at one stage um, because by using voice to text software, you are in fact training yourself in advocacy skills, aren't you? Because you're having to conceptualize what it is that you wish to convey to type. So you've got to put it into that verbal form and practice your advocacy. Just an idea. Now, back to Iraq. Issue, rule, application, conclusion. If you want in your assessment work, you can set out the work using those headings. I tend not to encourage that because we don't actually see that too often in practice. So if I ask you to provide an advice to a client or to make a submission to, a, to be used in a court or to prepare a memorandum to your senior partner, you know, all hypothetical exercises putting you in that role, you can use those headings if you want but I'd rather you consider it in terms of a general methodology of legal logic and legal reasoning. And it makes sense, doesn't it? 
in order to answer a problem in law, you need to identify what are the real issues here. You know, lecturers uh, and exam writers and problem writers, we love to put in red herrings, don't we? So we say, oh, look, we'll put that in and people might think that's a real issue, even though it's not. So the first thing is you've got to identify what are the real issues here? What are we actually talking about? Are we talking misrepresentation or are we talking mistake, for example? Um, so what are, what are the real issues? And then once you've identified the issue, then you can say, well, here's the law. The law is based on a well, primary source of law, uh, if you can, a statute or a case law. And then you think, well, now that we've identified it, how do the facts in this case um, pan out? How do we apply the law to ultimately come to a conclusion? So that's the legal logic. It's pretty, it's pretty obvious, I guess. Um, but we tend not to use those headings. So it should flow, um, but generally use your own heading and your own terminology is in, in my view. Have I confused anyone with those statements or indeed anything that we've discussed tonight? I know I'm talking at you a lot and thank you very much for your patience. All good so far? All right, good. Um, so flowcharts, I think, are very good, as I mentioned earlier, um, because it helps you to conceptualise this. <clears throat> what I'd recommend is that you, to some degree, create your own, whatever works for you, flowchart, checklist, um, dot point issue, not to directly replicate into an exam, but to give you some flow. So if you use the flow charts that, that, that are there, you might come across some cases or some legislation that relates to that particular part of the flow chart. So expand on it for your own information and your own record. So that'll make it easier when it comes to dealing with a take home paper uh, problem or um, a take home paper essay. So when you're reading the material, You'll be looking at it from the perspective of how do I use this material to answer a legal problem? What that means is, I guess you need to understand the difference between the key issues concerned. So can you identify, for example, the difference between unilateral mistake and common mistake or mutual mistake? Oh, I might ask the question right now. I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna ask you to explain it. All I'm after is a yes or no. But at this moment, do you have some way of identifying uh, and, and, and noting the difference between unilateral mistake, common mistake, and mutual mistake? Yes or no? Oh, I love the answers I'm getting. Lots of straightforward yes, the notes. The notes are very good in this unit. I've had other, so I'm a sessional lecturer. Uh, I'm not full time, obviously. Um, and sometimes I come in relatively late in the piece. And sometimes I have excellent material and other times it's not quite as good, uh, if I could put it that way. Uh, but the material that I've got in this unit is excellent. So you've got a really good start. Okay. So you need to know the difference between unilateral mistake and, the, and um, common mistake, mutual mistake, and it's sometimes not so obvious. So have some key pointers that works for you. Have a look at some of the questions, um, the tutorial problems, you know, you should really answer those. And I'd be keen for you to upload your answers and provide it there. Now, I know it's a bit brave, because you, you might think, well, what if I'm wrong? Well, with respect and in a very collegiate manner, your colleagues may say, I think you're wrong, or I may say, I think you're wrong. Um, that doesn't mean you are wrong, even if I say, because one of the, okay, here's one of the really good things about law, and this is really important. 
it's not maths and it's not physics, not chemistry. So there's not necessarily a right answer. Now, the problems that I create for you to answer for the assessment work are almost certainly one of two things. Number one, and this is the most common, something that I just make up. So I ask a question, you know, advise Jim. Well, what I think is the advice isn't necessarily right because you may come up with a different advice, a totally different conclusion and still get a HD. Do you understand what I'm getting at? Because there's not necessarily a right or wrong answer. Um, and the second source of problem questions um, is it might be based on a case. Now, where do I find cases relevant to particular areas? Well, we've got textbooks, we've got note up function, but sometimes I do this, I might think, all right, well, I want a problem that's based on, you know, section 55 of the Retail Shop Lease Act. Um, I'll go into note up, I might look at the fourth case down, look at it, look at the facts and go, oh, that's good. And then I might just, you know, work the facts around, change the names, change the circumstances, and that then becomes the problem question. So by looking at the cases, you might actually stumble across <laughs> the case that formed the basis of the question that you're asked to answer. And if you can then refer to that case in your legal, logical way of answering the question, so much the better. I hope that makes sense. But Bridget has identified what I'm really trying to get at here. And that is when you come to answer a legal problem, the conviction of your own answer is key. That's a great quote, Bridget. Thank you very much for that. And I do want you to make a call. You may not be right, but it doesn't matter so much, provided the basic fundamental material is there and you've got some good way of supporting the ultimate conclusion at which you arrive. It doesn't matter if it's the same conclusion as mine, most of the time. All good. You've been very patient. And do some of you have another unit that you're now going to for seven o'clock? Yes? All right. Well, what I'll try to do is I'll try to finish a couple of minutes early so at least you get a tiny break um, and eight o'clock as well. Um, for tonight, we've covered a fair area of practice. I think the most important case to do with mistake is probably Taylor and Johnson. Have a look at that, understand it. That's not the only one, of course, but um, that's one that really does come to mind pretty clearly. Are there any questions? comments before we wrap up. All good? All right. Thank you all. We'll see you next week. Thank you so much for so many attending. We'll see you then. Bye now. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.